Skanderbag, Skanderbag, does whatever a Skanderbag. Yeah, but like, what does a Skanderbag actually do, though? Oh, um, he's just, uh, uh, just a mascot that we've been workshopping. This video was sponsored by Audible. History is full of great generals. You've got Alexander, Hannibal, Sun Tzu, um, this guy. But not all big-brained military homies get the same amount of recognition. Some get movies, some get books, some get video games, and others get clickbaity YouTube videos. Guess which category today's star falls under? George Castriota was born in Albania in 1405 and spent his childhood wrapped in the warm embrace of his loving parents, except no he didn't because he got yeeted over to the Ottoman court to ensure Albanian cooperation, which kind of puts things in perspective. Your parents might not buy you a PS5, but at least you're not a diplomatic bargaining chip. You will be if you keep up that attitude. Next section, come on, next section. While he was chilling with the Turks, George converted to Islam and was given the name Lord Alexander, or Iskander Bey in Turkish. However, this name was corrupted into Skanderbeg seemingly during his lifetime, which is really funny to me because it means that he must have just never corrected anyone. A Aaron. All right, no A.A. Ron here today. Do we have a Skander Beg? Yeah, sure, that's close enough. Correct pronunciation or not, Skander Beg embraced his new title and made a name for himself serving in the Ottoman military. In fact, he was considered so trustworthy that when his dad finally kicked the bucket and the Ottomans took over his land, the Sultan let Skander Beg govern a portion of it. However, receiving just a small portion of his family's traditional land reignited Skanderbeg's loyalty to Albania. Nowadays, if your family died and the government only allowed you to keep your bedroom or, or something, you'd probably just become a libertarian and call it a day. But back in the 1440s, you had to scheme with locals and betray your benefactors. Now committed to liberating his homeland, all Skanderbeg had to do was wait for a moment of political instability to exploit. And since he lived in the Balkans, that didn't take very long. In 1443, a Christian army crossed into Serbia and smashed the Ottoman force sent to stop them. With their military presence in the Balkans temporarily crippled, the Ottoman provinces fell into disarray. Skanderbeg's plan could commence. It went something like this. Step 1. Join the army sent to fight the Christian invaders. Step 2. Leave the army sent to fight the Christian invaders. Step 3. Kidnap a politician and force him to write a fake document giving you command of the most strategic fortress in Albania. He might snitch later though, so uh, you should probably just kill him. Step 4. Ride to Albania and give the commander of the fortress your fake document. He's a trusting guy, so he'll totally just let you in. Step 5. After the old commander leaves, wait until nighttime to bring all your boys into the fortress completely undetected. Step 6. Slaughter the entire Ottoman garrison while they sleep. You're home late, Gary. Hey, G wait, you're not Gary! Step 7. Convert to Christianity. Also, you know what, f*** it, kill everyone who won't. Inspired by Skanderbeg's shenanigans, local revolts soon spread across all of Albania. With the Ottoman military still incapacitated, many of these rebellions succeeded, and by the end of 1443, most of northern and central Albania had been liberated. The various rebel leaders then met in the city of Lej and unanimously chose Skanderbeg as the supreme commander of the Albanian army. Uh, which didn't exist yet. Pulling a Mulan and conscripting one man from every household gave Skanderbeg a fighting force of almost 18,000, which is actually significantly larger than the current Albanian army. However, unlike the current Albanian military, Skanderbeg's army had horsey boys. Perfect for ambushes. You know, these are some nice mountains. It would be a real shame if someone were to cover them in bunkers and Chinese ammunition. Alright, if, if I just watch out in front of me, I'll have time to brace, and then... 
look forward, um, look back. <laughs> Those are the only two ways that they can get me, right? These successive victories over the Ottomans cemented Skanderbeg's leadership, but also brought him to the attention of everyone's favorite ecological time bomb, Venice. The Venetians had some colonies nearby, and now that Skanderbeg was rebelling, they didn't want the Albanians in their territory to get any funny ideas about independence. After all, Italians aren't exactly the kindest rulers. You will eat the pasta! Pasta supremacy aside, the Venetians were just generally not the best neighbors, so after some provocation, Skanderbeg declared war in 1447. Unfortunately, the Ottomans invaded Albania pretty much right after, so Skanderbeg had to peace out with the Venetians and rush over to the other side of the country to fight the Ottomans. He wasn't quick enough though, and the Ottomans were able to seize an important fortress. At this point, Skanderbeg had been in talks with Hungary for a while about linking up and Gaddafi stomping the Ottomans together. They finally decided to meet up in Serbia and fight the huge Ottoman army campaigning in the area. However, when Skanderbeg and his army got to the border, the king of Serbia refused them entry. Talk about a buzzkill! Good thing the Serbs and Albanians get along so well now though. During the border holdup, the Hungarian army got absolutely dunked on, leaving Skanderbeg and his tiny force to face the 100,000 Ottomans alone. Conducting a tactical retreat, Skanderbeg led the vastly superior Ottoman army to Krui, the same castle where he had, um, uh, done the stuff. The fortress itself was now only garrisoned by 1,500 men, so there was no way the siege was going to take very long. Oh, that's what I forgot. The coats. Hey, Steve, I remember... Steve? Oh look, he's frozen solid. The lull in the fighting lasted just long enough for the old sultan to die and be replaced by his son, Mehmed II, who sent two armies into Albania. Don't worry though, Skanderbeg just completely demolished both of them. Mehmed sent another army in 1453, but he was really more focused on another side project at that point, so I don't even know if he noticed when Skanderbeg ambushed them. However, it would only be a matter of time before his gaze, uh, once more, fell upon Albania. You know, that kind of sounds like the end of a fan fiction, not a section of a history video. At the end of 1456, Skanderbeg finally had a son. I've been too busy telling you about his military exploits to mention his family, but you know, man's was wifed up. I guess you could say that he was somebody's uh, Skander Bay. <laughs> However, not everyone was happy about Skanderbeg becoming a dad. Notably, his nephew and current heir Hamza was pretty bent out of shape about the whole thing because he figured that he probably wouldn't be heir for much longer. Since talking about your feelings hadn't been invented yet, Hamza felt like his only option was to defect to the Ottomans and offer to violently overthrow his uncle. Naturally, this sounded like a great deal to Mehmed, so he furnished Hamza with a shiny new army of 80,000 men, which was promptly ambushed and massacred. Except for Hamza, he got a chance to apologize. This will be the hardest video I've ever had to make. I owe Skanderbeg an apology with no excuses. We're all human and we all make mistakes. Anyway, uh, he totally got his head cut off. Tired of getting ambushed, Mehmed then offered Skanderbeg a three-year truce, which Skanderbeg used as an opportunity to invade Italy. When he got back though, the Ottomans greeted him with three more armies to defeat, one by one. Now really sick of getting ambushed, Mehmed went all out and offered Skanderbeg a 10 year truce, which Skanderbeg gladly accepted because Albania had like seven people who could still stand at this point. Wait, what's this? Dear Skander, um, however you pronounce it. Up here in Rome, we're very invested in your success against the Ottoman Empire. It's why we've offered you almost no material support. Anyway, I'm thinking of launching a crusade pretty soon, so you should probably just break your truce with the Ottomans. Love, Pope. Okay, uh, that was weird. Wait, is there another one? Do they have like Usain Bolt delivering these or what? Dear Spanderbex, if you're getting this letter, it means that I've died and there actually won't be a crusade anymore. So if you've already broken your truce with the Ottomans, you should uh, uh, probably just um, pray 
or something. Love, Pope. This new war with the Ottomans was made even more inconvenient when Mehmed himself arrived in Albania with a massive army. He then besieged Krui, while Skanderbeg did the thing where he ran away into the mountains and messed with the Ottoman supply line. After several months though, the walls of Krui were still standing, so Mehmed took half of his army and just built his own fortress. Skanderbeg wasn't a super big fan of having an Ottoman castle in his backyard, so he launched a counteroffensive and defeated the Ottomans outside of Krui. But by the time he reached the newly constructed Ottoman stronghold, Mehmed had already dipped and there were hella Ottomans holed up inside. Mehmed then rolled up to Albania again with a new army. Beelining it for Krui, Mehmed and his army set up camp, but then plague broke out and most of the army had to leave. Skanderbeg mopped up everyone left. Albania remained free. Skanderbeg had defeated almost every enemy put before him, while constantly being outgunned and outnumbered. With him at the helm, Albania stood strong against the win- Oh, he died from a fever. Do you like entertainment? Do you like inspiration? Do you like, um, tickling your, your noggin? Luckily, today's sponsor Audible has all of those things and more. Audible has pretty much every audiobook that you could ever think of, plus a bunch of other stuff like podcasts and comedy shows, for example. Some of my favorite audiobooks on Audible are the Ender's Shadow series and Child 44. I'd recommend both normally as books, but they're even better as audiobooks because you can like, do stuff while you listen. Last time I tried to read a book while I drove, I had to have a lot of awkward conversations with government people, but now that I can listen to audiobooks, there's nothing that can stop me from enjoying literature while aimlessly driving around the Midwest. Audible also has a new Plus catalog that adds a bunch of exclusive content to the mix in case you get bored of the like 800 billion other audiobooks they have. You also get a free audiobook every month to keep forever with a premium membership. Even better, Audible has a free trial that lasts for a whole month, so if you want to try it out, you can just go to www.audible.com slash historyhouse or text historyhouse to 500-500. Not only will you get to enjoy a free trial, but you'll also help my channel out, so it's a double whammy. Is, it th is that the right terminology? I don't, I don't play sports.